with uh, all, all these sort of different plans that, that are, are coming forth, um, do you feel that um, commercial companies are better off to, to kind of have their own safety standards and to set their own limit of, of where the risk should be? Or do you feel that um, they should be able to comply with, say, NASA standards? They certainly don't want to comply with NASA standards. That would be, that would be the end of the industry because NASA doesn't fly much. And the reason they don't fly much is because their standards are ridiculous. And they, they, should, be do, they should be thinking about how to self-regulate. And, uh, and I propose that in the book. I propose some, some models that they could use that are based on existing ways of doing things in the maritime industry. The maritime industry is a good model in a couple ways. One is, is with the, what we call classification societies that were established back in the 18th century in the coffee houses of, of Europe, where all these ship owners and, and uh, operators were trying to get together to figure out how to uh, allocate risk and reward amongst themselves. You know, uh, how much does the captain get? How much does the owner get? And how do you, how do you establish how risky this mission, so to speak, is? And they developed uh, these independent organizations that everybody agreed that you know we will kind of go by these standards. And they developed seaworthiness standards, you know, that they could then use to determine you know liability. And you could, they could be doing a similar thing uh, here, but it would probably in order to provide the appropriate legal uh, robustness, it would help if Congress would actually incorporate that into law, perhaps with an amendment of the Commercial Space Launch Act. Uh, but the other way Amer the maritime is an interesting model is we, ha we have a Coast Guard. And you know everybody expects Coast Guard people to go out and risk their lives. They go out and rescue people. And we don't have anything like that in space. We don't have a, uh, anything like a Coast Guard where, where you have somebody that can do search and rescue, who can serve constabulary duties, you know, inspect, inspect a ship to see does it, does it meet for certain standards, is it, is it carrying contraband or whatever. We don't have anything like that. Uh, people can say it's premature for it, but if we had something like that, that would be an organization that wouldn't be the NASA with all of its historical burden, you know, and, and astronauts as heroes and we can't lose our astronauts and so on. There would just be another service that would be, probably be attached to this. Air Force, a similar way that the Navy is attached to the Coast Guard, or the Coast Guard is attached to the Navy, particularly in time of war. Uh, and it would be a uniformed service, except it would, it would be civilian, and then it would report to a civilian agency as the uh, Coast Guard used to to the Department of Transportation. Now it's now it's the Department of Homeland Security since they munched, munched it all together, which was a mistake. But but uh, that's neither here nor The point is that it could be a, it's a very good model, uh, and it would, it's a good model that al would allow us to take normal risks, just as we do in every other aspect of life, and would, would make space not so special anymore. If there was some sort of Coast, or coast Guard, or, or, or rather, uh, Orbital Guard. Space Guard. <laughs> space Guard, good. <laughs> that's, that, that's, what was, that's how it was proposed by the what Air Force captain. What sort of agency should they report to, though? Pardon? What sort of civilian agency should they report to? Uh, they would, they could, rep well, they'd probably report to DHS. If, if DHS still existed at the time this was put together and they haven't come to their senses and, and uh, broken it up and made more sense out of it. But yeah, I mean, that, that's, where the, that's where the Coast Guard reports would make sense to have the Space Guard report in the same place. Now, um, uh, there was an interesting point that, that you brought up uh, um, in, in a conversation before where you were talking about how on orbit in, uh, at the space station, they have these plans that if anything were to go wrong to, to, to leave the station and to come back down to or Earth. But you had a, a, an interesting idea of having some sort of on orbit safe haven or, or oasis for situations like that. Can you expand upon that idea a little bit? Well, yeah, traditionally, a lifeboat is something that you get into when your ship is in trouble and you, you know, you try to get to a nearby island or you hope that there's another ship nearby that you can get to. Uh, you know, the lifeboats on the Titanic, ignoring the fact that they didn't have enough of them, which was actually a problem of overregulation or is over prescriptive regulation because it, it hadn't been updated to reflect bigger ships. They just, it just had a number of lifeboats you had to have without how, you know, any consideration of how many you actually needed. Uh, but the, the idea of the, of the lifeboats of Titanic was not to get them all the way back to Southampton or all the way up ahead to New York. It was to you know, allow them to stay alive long enough till they could be rescued by the Carpathia or the Californian or one of the, you know, whichever ship had heard them in time if they, they got the radio signal right. 
But NASA's, NASA's idea of a lifeboat is to go all the way back to Southampton. They say if, if something goes wrong with the space station, we need to be able to get everyone all the way back to Earth you know, immediately. And that's very expensive. And the point I would make is why is it that space researchers are so much more valuable than Antarctic researchers? Because for six months out of the year, you know, from say, October through April, you cannot get to the South Pole Station. It's, it's you know, brutal sub-zero temperatures. It's dark all the time. You know, it's just simply there's no vehicle that can get there. Uh, so people who are wintering in, in at the South Pole are wintering at the South Pole. They're, they're not going anywhere. And, you know, people, uh, you know, one of the, the station's physician came down with breast cancer. Um, somebody uh, died from methanol poisoning. Uh, people, have, people have gotten sick. A woman had a stroke. That one of the, the facility manager had a stroke, and they couldn't do anything till spring. And NSF accepts it. The National Science Foundation accepts that because they just say, "Well, this is science. It's important, and you know, it's, you don't have billions of dollars to for a special, you know, South Pole rescue vehicle. If we did, we'd spend it on something that makes more sense." But NASA, won. NASA, for years, for decades, has wanted billions of dollars for, for a lifeboat that has no other purpose except to you know, evacuate the space station. A, a, a hundred billion dollar facility, which in evacuating it, you put it in danger, which is what they were contemplating doing last year. They've been, the thing had been continuously occupied for over a decade, and everybody thought, well, we finally reached the point where there's never again going to be a time when there aren't people in space. But NASA was con seriously considering abandoning the ISS last year because they were concerned about the reliability of the Soyuz rockets and, and, the, and the capsules to get them back down. So they didn't want to risk an astronaut. They were willing to sacrifice and possibly lose a $100 billion space facility because they didn't want to risk a crew. That, that, uh, uh, you know, a Navy shipman would think that's nuts. You, know, you, you will die to save your ship if you have to. So then, uh, how can the industry and uh, how can we start to kind of reform a lot of these things to, to use a lot more common sense in these situations? I think we just need to spread the word and start talking about it. This is just a conversation that we never have. You know, we just there are all these assumptions. People just uh, we people just it's pick they accept it as a given because that's the way it's always been. Astronauts are heroes, and we got to do everything we can to make sure we never lose one. You know, it's kind of ironic. It's like they're not really national heroes; they're national treasures that are so valuable we can't risk them on something so as hazardous as a space flight. And when you say it that way, it points out how absurd our attitude is. You know, this is the harshest frontier we've ever opened. It's, there's no air. You know, there's no food. There's no no animals. You know, meat running around on the hoof. You know, you've, you've, it's, it's a place where you need extreme technology. It's much, much more than the Arctic was. You know, in the Arctic, if you have the right technology, at least there's air up there, you know, and you can, you can hunt whales and seals and stuff. And then you get, if you have furs and fire, then you can, you can survive. Uh, space is going to be the same way. It just takes some higher level of technology, but it's a tough frontier. And if you to think we're not going to open it without losing lives, it's, it's crazy. But the, that's the real problem, is that most people don't think of it as a frontier. They don't think of it as a place to be settled. We haven't decided in our hearts as a nation that we want to settle space. And that was the point of the last chart I, I gave in that briefing, is we have to make that decision. We have to have a resolve that we're going to start taking this seriously. We're going to say this is a place for settlement and development. And we recognize we're going to lose people in doing it. And that's OK, because that's the way it's always been. And if we'd been afraid to lose people, we wouldn't have opened up the New World. We wouldn't have opened up the West. And we're not going to open up space either if we don't change our attitude. Anytime you hear somebody say safety is the highest priority, hit them on the head. Just, just hit them on the head so hard they have to unbutton their shirt to eat. You know, because it's it's a dumb thing to say. Safety, if safety is the highest priority, then nothing else is important. 